Uh, what I'd like to do this morning is I want to approach this whole thing about youth and mission from the Asian perspective. I understand that this is a Euro predominantly European conference, but I thought it would be good for you to have a glimpse of some of the struggles and challenges and opportunities we face from the majority world, apart from all the other issues of millennials and gener generation X's and all that. Um, I want to begin also by um, thanking the European missionaries for obeying the Great Commissions and being sent out by the churches and brought the gospel to my part of the world, to Asia, to China, and then later on to the Southeast Asian countries. Compared to Europe, you are celebrating 500 years of Reformation. Uh, our church history is just almost reaching 200 years in Asia. So we are babies compared to you guys. But this is what happened. The churches in Asia have matured over the years. They have grown up. And now we want a share of what God is doing around the world. And we are knocking at the doors of mission organizations and different groups, and we are finding it challenging um, for many reasons. But before I get to that, um, I have spent you know, my years growing up in, in Singapore, worked with OM uh, for several decades. Then I was sent to China, where I lived for six years in China, working there. And now I'm based in Singapore. And all across Asia, in my conversations with Christian leaders and church leaders, um, I hear one common theme among them, and that is, we want to be a part of the missionary forces in the world. And they meant it. And um, just take for a look, for, look, at, look at China. China, wow, I mean, the, the, I can spend a whole day talking about the church in China. And, um, but today, the most conservative numbers given by anyone would be between 100 and 130 million believers in China. And of that, some Christians got together and they want to trust God together for 100,000 missionaries to go from China to Jerusalem. There are two silk roads that will take you to, um, from China to Jerusalem. One is the northern route and one is the southern route through India, but they end up in the same destination. And they said the gospel has reached us from Jerusalem through the west. And now it is our turn to take the gospel westward, reaching all the Central Asian countries and then into Jerusalem and along the way, plant communities of Jesus followers. 100,000 Chinese are committed to that. And then on top of that, Korea. Korea already has a track record of about 33,000 missionaries currently serving outside Korea. And then Philippines is a growing nation of many, um, uh, many people. Every day, 3,700 Filipinos leave their country for overseas employment. And then recently, a movement has started in the Philippines to train the evangelical um, Filipinos who want to go overseas as foreign workers, but with the intention of bringing the gospel to the homes of the people. Middle East is one of those countries. And so out of the 3,700 people that leave every day, it is estimated that 1% or about 30 people are those people, Christian believers, evangelicals, who received the call of missions to go into other countries. So that represents 30 people living from the Philippines every day. Indonesia, a Muslim nation, some say the largest Muslim nation in the world. I was in a meeting two years ago and an Indonesian pastor said to us that every week, 5,000 Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus, every week. And the government will not acknowledge that, but many Christians are saying that, that are about 30% of the populations will consider themselves Christians in Indonesia. And many of them are thinking missions today. So here's a question. Why are they not in the mission field? And what is slowing them down? And when, you know, why, you know, what is slowing the process? And why am I not seeing all these people? And if you look at the populations of the majority world, uh, more and more, the churches that are growing faster, the Christians there are, are, are vibrant, energetic, and they, catch, they have the vision, and I believe that they will be the future major suppliers of missionary workers um, into the next generation. 
And um, so we try to address the question, why are they not with us and why they are not? And I want to just share with you this morning um, some of the practical experiences and some of the um, findings that we, we find through OM. OM celebrates 60 years. I'm using OM as a case study, so you have to bear with me. Um, OM celebrates 60 years. Uh, this year, 60 years of ministry. We praise God for his um, faithfulness. Um, and we, mo- we have moved from the founder's era to the post-founder era. And I am the first person appointed as a post-founder era leader. Now, um, when George Verwer and his gang started OM, they were innovators, they were passionate, they have an imagination. And they moved quickly from imagination to launch. And, uh, and then they just took it. OM grew just like a mom and pop business and they keep adding different things all along the way until it became a totally picture from the original intention. So when I took over and the thing to do is to start listening and ask questions. And so that's what we did. We spent two years listening. So all the information I've collected is the result of interviews face to face with 172 uh, Christian leaders from around the world. Each interview took two hours. And, um, and then also we did a survey among 3,000 people, but got reply from 1,480. So we put all this information together with the help of Pat McMillan, he's here, a consultant. And in um, and the last two years, we unpacked all those things. And so those surveys include CEOs of mission organizations, churches, youth leaders, and all this. And we just want to listen to them and ask them about some of the challenges. Here are some of the challenges, the pitfalls. One thing that has been repeated over and over again is that the current missionary model is locked in time. It is outdated. It is not working anymore. And um, why? Because one, it is not sustainable. It is not financially sustainable. The congregations and the churches that we have today in the two-thirds world are small congregations. 80 people, 30 people in China. And in China, an average pastor earns less than 150 to 200 US dollars a month. And if you want them to send missionaries to work with organizations like OM, now we pride ourselves in OM as one of the most economical missionary organizations. But when I mentioned the figure to the Chinese, they couldn't, they couldn't swallow it because they says, you guys are asking us to raise support out of 30 people, 40 people, to support a missionary who is going to be paid four or five times higher or three times higher than my pastor. Is it is not possible. And the problem is our model is not sustainable. And we thought that this is probably the Chinese problem. Then we asked around other people, and this is what I got from a Southern Baptist um, leader. This, this person works very closely with David Platt. And he said to me that 80% of the Southern Baptist pastors couldn't live on their salary. So their spouses will have to work or they have to find a part-time job to supplement their income. So the model that we have to support Christian leaders, pastors, and missionaries are not scalable. They are not sustainable. And something something has to be done about it. And then coming to this thing about scalable, we, we want exponential growth of missionary. I don't want OM to be an organization that have 4,000, 5,000 people. I want an organization with 5,000 people that mobilize 500,000 people. That's what we are thinking today. This is where OM is heading. So we have to think in terms of a model that is scalable, a model that can engage the youth, can excite the youth and all that. And so we recognize that the financial model that we have in place are outdated and it is, um, it is not sustainable because the church budget is limited, missions department budget is limited, and, um, and it has no provisions for the future. And another thing that we find is that is challenging for the young people from Asia um, that want to join us, it's the requirements that we place on these people. Uh, it, is, it is very Eurocentric, if I could use the word because OM is a predominantly Europe organization. So when those people want to join us, they look at us and they say, look, your requirements is too Eurocentric. For example, um, not just OM, but other organizations, they, uh, they want people with seminary or Bible school background. 
We don't have seminaries in China unless you want to go to the state seminary. Most of the sem seminaries are underground seminaries. There are no formal degrees, no formal structure. People just come together. These people are grounded in the Word of God. But, you know, you want them to go to four years of school, you know, it's impossible. They are, and then also people from the global south, the young people, their emphasis is not so much on teaching and papers, but more on practical work. They want to learn through the experience. And so we place all this thing before them. Support raising, language training. And, um, you know, they say, well, can I just go straight into Kaza language? Do I have to learn English? And then from English to Kaza language, why, am, why are you burdening me with two languages when I want to join the Kaza people? And um, so all that are some of the challenges that we, uh, mission organizations, have in place that are preventing these people and from accelerating the speed of them joining us. And we are addressing that. We are addressing that. And another, another major problem is the dichotomy we place between ministry and work. If you want to be a missionary, great, join us. And what is your background? Oh, you're a chemist. Sorry, we have no, no need for a chemist. But if you come and work with OM, and then you love OM, you love the Lord Jesus Christ, and you want to do anything OM tells you to do, and we'll say to you, come, be a truck driver. And so you, you accepted it and be a truck driver, but you're not fulfilled, you're not, you're, you're gifting, your experiences and your knowledge is not put in use, and then in the end you become the solution. And, uh, and we find that it's so true over the years. And we place a, dic a dichotomy between ministry and work. If you want to come to the ministry, you've got to leave your work behind and just take on whatever work we give you. So now we are looking at it and says, can we join the two? I don't know what is the best English word to describe. Can we break down or destroy this dichotomy and say, why don't you want to bring your work and come with us and join us and serve the Lord? So we, we, then the other problem, the language we chose is that we differentiate between a full-time worker and a self-supporting worker. And somehow if a person is self-supporting, they find that they do not have a place when they are among the full-time workers. They are more spiritual, we are more inferior because we have to work for our money. These people, they trust God for their money. And um, another common, a common thing that came out of the survey is that the young people are saying that their skills and their knowledge are not put in use. And they come and join us, but we make them do other things. And um, the other question is belonging and becoming. Which come first? Do I have to be a missionary before I belong to the mission organizations? Or can I belong to the mission organizations and become a missionary later? And uh, so how do we address that? Um, then the other third area, um, pitfalls, is that we sideline our organization like OM sideline the use of today. I was shocked when I hear that. I thought OM is one of the most attractive mission organizations in the world, mm -hmm. especially for the young people, because every year OM engages about 7,000 young people, teenagers in our program. In Europe alone, Teen Street is 4,000 people. And then we got Teen Streets in other countries, MDT in Africa, and other different program, internship program. Um, and, um, and many of these young people, out of the 7,000 young people that came with us on the yearly program, only 300 of those who signed up with OM for the, for the sorry, out of the 7,000 that come to the one, two week program, only 300 will sign up for our year program. And um, so we began to ask them why. I, I'm always asking why because I don't have the answer. And then this is what I found out, and you may find this very interesting. Some of you may relate to it. The young people today are not brand loyal. Their parents can serve with OM, their church can be supporting OM, but if OM does not give them what they want, they will start shopping for another group. And they will keep shopping until they find a group that represents their interests. So they are not brand loyal at all. We thought they were. Wow, once you come to Teen Street, you're all the way to OM. Nuh -uh. If you don't give them what they want, they go somewhere else. And then, and that's why I asked you this question earlier on, uh, Evie. The Americans, I don't have any sources to quote, but the Christian leaders told me that 75% of the youth aged between 18 and 26 that come from Christian family, Christian background, are, are 
do not go to church today. And um, he, so these people have not left their faith. They left the church, but they did not leave the faith. What if they want to join OM? Do we have space for them? Or do we need the pastor's recommendation? We need some elders, you know, references. You know, can we accept them without the support of a church or without the recommendation of the church? Um, young people cannot think long term. Six months is too long for them. And so when we ask them to come for a one year, two year <coughs> program, it's like a lifetime commitment. Mm -hmm. And I think of other mission organizations that are thinking of these people and asking them for the four year commitment at a time. For this, today's youth is too long. Do we need to change that or not? Mm -hmm. We found out that the young people, they don't want money, you know, so OM is happy to hear that because we don't pay people well. <laughs> um, they don't want positions. And what do they want is they want impact. They want to be given the opportunity to impact the world. Can we offer them that? And of course, so for them, support raising is not attractive. They rather go and earn their own money. And then um, for social in, China, in, the, in the Asian culture, the social and cultural challenges we find is Today's family in, in Asia, they, they no longer have large family like my parents. My parents have many children because we are their insurance policy for their future. And, uh, but today, with one or two child, you know, the parents have no insurance policy in their children. And if they, if they are the only child and they want to go serve in the mission, then who is going to take care of the parents? And that added complications because many families in Asia today have one or two children. And they, the parents want to have children by their side when they're growing old. And also when we raise support, let's say we raise support to, uh, for mission work, we have to factor in financial support for our parents because in their old age, they needed money. And it is only right for the Asian culture to give money to the parents. So that added additional expense expenses. And another cultural thing um, that is frowned upon in the Asian culture is to live on, char on charity it is, is a, a bad attribute yeah, for the Asians. So these are some of the challenges that we have. My time is coming, uh, I'm eating up. Um, let me go to the opportunities. All these things have presented us with all these different challenges and it is forcing us, it is disrupting us uh, in OM to, mix, to change our strategy and our plan. And we have done that. And so what we've done is we created a count, uh, what we call sustainability program in many of our fields now. We have included business innovations into our fields. Some people, some mission organizations may find that difficult to accept, but we are doing it. And we have, by God's grace, see uh, a number of successful um, results. For example, in Zambia in 2009, when Zambia became an OM entity, we had only nine Zambians serving full-time with OM. Many more wanted to join us, but we don't have the financial support uh, for them. To cut the long story short, we, we were able to raise money for, for, to buy land, and German architect built the place for us for free, and we built the first apartment. They were German quality, so only the government officials and the foreigners can afford to rent it. So we upped the rent, they are willing to pay, we bought a second property, developed it, and now we have three properties in Zambia. OMers are working there for extra income. Today we have 127 Zambians. 70% of their operation comes from the income from the building. Wow. And so that reduces their dependency on external source for support. And they were able to send more people. We see that repeated in, in, in China. We saw that in Nepal and many other countries. And today we have 46 such projects all in OM to help sustain the ministry. And then another thing that we are also faced with the challenge is can we recruit people who want to bring their profession with them to come and serve with us. And, and this is disrupting. For me, it means losing control. Uh, but, you know, Holy Spirit is in control. God is in control. And so we are now seriously thinking, and we have created, if you read one of the books written by one of our leaders called Scatter Global, and we have created opportunities for people to work overseas, and you can bring your profession with you. And then once you are there, we plug you into the OM team to create communities of Jesus followers in that whole place. Um, I, 
we, we are changing our structure, we're changing our mission statement, everything simply to cater for the use of today. The Bible verse that came to mind was from 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. The children of Issachar understood the time and Israel knew what to do. We are praying to God that we will understand the time and know what to do in today's, uh, in today's generation. So, um, so, well, I mean, maybe when we go to question and answer, I can answer some questions. I just want to leave you with this thought. A few years ago in Canada, I met the leader of a Filipino diaspora. And he, he, was, he has his background with OM, so he came up to me, introduced himself, and then he says, if OM were to change their recruiting policy, I can add 1,000 missionaries into your workforce within two months. And I says, how are you going to do that? And then he told me every day, 3,700 Filipinos would leave, and he says among them, 30 of them would go with the mindset of becoming a missionary in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. They work as a domestic maid. They go to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. They go to all these countries. And then they say, we don't need visa. We don't need accommodation. We don't even need financial support because it's all provided for by our employer. But only one thing is that we want to be recognized as a missionary and be supported and encouraged by the mission organizations. Mm -hmm. Are you prepared to accept us? And that is disrupting our thinking. But I think that is a future to engage the youth of today.